Hi guys, thanks for this episode of Nick Egan Times. On this episode, we have an awesome guest. We have Wordplay TJ. T- Wordplay TJ is a hip hop artist, music producer, podcaster, and music business YouTuber who makes his music for the underdog. That music is a soundtrack for everyone who has the willingness to persevere through the odds. His philosophy shows up on his YouTube channel where he shares music business advice to other artists on the No Rhyme or Reason podcast with co co-host Icarus Gray and in his growing collection of songs and albums on the streaming platforms. Welcome and thanks for coming on my podcast. Thank you, Nick, for having me. I, I, I really, really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, all right, let's just talk about how's the pandemic and life been since it's obviously kicked in. Yeah, so <laughs> that's a that's a that's an interesting one because it's hard for me to know where 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 to start. Uh, ultimately, it's uh, stressful, right? It's it's a up and down thing um, here in the here in the states. It's uh, mandates from from left to right, and uh, there's not really. I, I feel like there's a, a unwillingness for most of us to kind of come together and get on the same page, and I, I think that would be the end of it if we were to kind of do that and have a collaborative effort around it, but. Because there's a, a focus on kind of individualism, I feel as if that we're we're continuously in that. And so that's really how it's been. It's just been a fight for collaboration, in my opinion. Yeah, sweet. Have you have you got the vaccine? Are you for the vaccinations? Yeah, I'm I'm vaccinated. I am for vaccinations. Um I really, really am into the science and I'm really into the data, the facts, the statistics and things of that nature. Um, here in America and in, in black culture, it's um, it's a thing where we are a, a little skeptical of, you know, kind of hospitals and um, vaccinations in general, because, you know, our people have been um, subjugated to testing and, and a lot of different things in the medical field where it's really difficult for us to, to trust. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of folks that have, you know, kind of common sense, can rationalize and, and take the opportunity to kind of get vaccinated. And that's where that's where I stand. And so, um, although there are some risks, um, I believe that the benefits outweigh them. Yeah, that's great insights. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. All right, let's, let's just jump straight into it. Tell me about your life growing up, your family, and yeah, how it's all begun for you. Yeah, so I'm from a little town called Little Rock, Arkansas, smack dab in the middle of the country um, here in the United States. And I um, I, I, Little Rock was a, a difficult place to kind of grow up in. Um, folks talk about like the violence in New York City in the 90s and the violence in LA in the 90s. And Little Rock was a, a echo chamber for, for some of that. Um, the, the crack and, and cocaine that, that kind of filtered from uh, LA made its way to the, to the Mid-South and it started to affect my community in a negative way when I was growing up. And so that was, that was my environment. I was growing around, around, you know, gangs and drugs and and violence. And my family did their best to uh, keep me out of that. So they stayed, you know, kept me focused in school. Um, After school, I had, you know, consistent reminders for like homework and staying disciplined and all these other things. I have a military family. So, you know, we had structure and discipline in our, in our home. And so, um, and, and many of my, my folks had been to college before. So they had that education to kind of help prop us up a bit. And so my experience was a little bit different from some of the folks in my, in my neighborhood. And that was okay. So I was exposed to music and that's why I'm here today because I, I started to get into music, get into art. And, and have that free time and that leisure time to not worry about my needs, but uh, worry about being creative. Yeah, that's amazing. What, um, what, I guess, growing up, were the best things that shaped you as a person? And was music always something that you were going to go into? Music wasn't something that I was always going to go into, um, but I have a musical household, right? So that's what, that's what shaped me 
uh, to get there. Um, my uncle is a producer, songwriter, a performer, and rapper. My aunt is a songwriter and, and performer. Um, my dad would always sing and, and he played instruments. He played the saxophone. Um, and m m many of my family members were in the church choir. And so I got an understanding and exposure of music early on, but that wasn't my first love. My first, you know, kind of love was, was doing art, drawing, painting, all of those things. And I did that up until my, my teenage years. And then when I turned 14, I started doing music professionally. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Let's talk about, um, place, obviously going into the music industry. How did that all transpire? So tell me about that journey from where you started to where you are now. Okay. So, um, as I said, my journey started at, at the age of 14. I was in a group at that time in high school and uh, they, made me, they made me audition one day at like lunch. And um, at the time I was, I was just the singer because I had taken choir from the time that I was in elementary school all the way up until my senior year in high school. And so I just like to sing and vocalize in that way. And I still, to this day, um, pride myself on being more of a vocalist than I am a musician of, uh, of any other kind. And so um, I sung that day, they liked my singing, and then they brought me into the group. And fast forward, you know, the group disbanded. I went solo and started rapping a as a way to express myself because I love poetry and things of that nature. Um, even more so after that, I, I formed my, my company on a map music group in 2005, and I was still in high school at that time. And then, uh, you know, kind of years later, five years later, my first single Breakfast and Biggie came out. And that's when, you know, my, my career really started to shift. That single and that music video got premiered on MTV's Rap Fix Live, where uh, Sway and Ja Rule gave it a lot of love and a lot of, um, uh, you know, kind of credibility. And that started my professional music career outside of just like doing it independently. And so, you know, kind of years later, I, I kept going, I kept evolving my brand. I was once TJ before, and then I became Wordplay TJ in 2013. And since 2013, I've been on this journey of uh, focusing on music for the underdog, which is, you know, kind of understanding that we all have, we all take these L's at some point in our lives, and we have to use those L's to learn from them. And, and if we're taking those losses, they're, they're not just losses, they're learning opportunities. And that's what I've been focused on with Music for the Underdog since 2013. That's really impressive. Well done. Thank um, you. Tell me the inspiration, I guess, between all the music now you're writing and doing. Um, what is inspiration? What motivates that? Um, I'm inspired by life, right? When I draw and, and paint and all these, these other things, I tend to um, try to emulate or mimic what's going on in real life. And my, my music is not really that different. Now, I may have some stories in my music where I haven't actually lived them, but I'm, I'm taking on the perspective or the persona of somebody else that has. And um, Ultimately, what I'm trying to do is, is tell a story, right? I'm trying to tell a story of what I've experienced or what somebody else has experienced so the, the viewer uh, or the listener can understand exactly what that experience is like. So there's some empathy there. Uh, that's, that's the majority of my work and, and, the, and how it's inspired. Wonderful. What, what's the best advice you've ever received? Um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's a, that's a difficult one. I, I think I get advice all the time. Um, and ultimately I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know which specific piece is, sticks with me the, sticks with me the most. I know that what I've come to learn is the same thing that I talked about earlier, where your, your, your losses aren't losses, they're, they're wins. And so 
if I can say that there's some advice that I've learned, it's through um, it's through teaching in the in the schools here, uh, computer science. And when we're learning computer science, we're problem solving, and we're doing it over and over and over and over again. Um, and that repetition, that problem solving, is a form of understanding what those those losses are and those learning opportunities are. I can say that I do have some some mentors and some folks that I look up to. And Robert Greene is one of those those folks. So I, I've read his book, Mastery. And in that book, it, it's really it's really about understanding that if you're going to do something, you need to do it with all of your your force and your 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 energy. You should put all of that into that that thing and become the master of that that thing that you do. So me performing, rapping, producing, like most of my time should be spent doing that until I, I, I've become the master at that. And then I can maybe spend a little bit of time going to do the business and understanding the business and things of that nature. And my career is kind of backwards. I started off mastering the business first and uh, doing a lot of the art um, in, 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 in the spare time. And now it's the, now, now it's the flip of that. I do more art than I do a uh, business at this point because it's, I have my systems in place. What do you enjoy or what do you prefer better? Um, <laughs> I actually like creating better, even though, you know, I, some folks look at me and they, or they, they have conversations with me and they're like, man, you're really great at this, at this business thing. And it's like, yeah, i I understand that and I appreciate that that perspective. Um, but ultimately I'd rather be making the, the art and it's it's a it's a skill that I'd rather uh exercise. That's incredible. Um tell me about your YouTube channel and your podcast. Yeah, so my YouTube channel is um it's all of my my art, all of my brand encompassed in one place. And it has uh, multiple different factors, right? There's the music itself. Um, there's the artwork that I create that's attached to the music. There is um, my book, Fake Blues, Creating in the, uh, the Face of Anxiety. I talk about that on the channel. And uh, the majority of my channel traffic comes from music advice. And so I, I, as I go through this journey of understanding the business a little bit better every day or learning new things about the business, I teach other independent artists how to do that. And so I've been able to make some really great connections. Um, folks like um, some of the managers for, for Wu-Tang and, and Old Dirty Bastard. Um, my my homie Big Moochie and um and some other folks that I've connected with that you know I've I've been able to teach them how to maximize their music business as well as my own. And so that's a bulk of my YouTube channel. The podcast is called No Rhyme or Reason. Me and my my co-host Icarus Gray, we've been friends since like first grade. And so we decided to make a podcast that was about everything for no reason at all. And most, most of what we talk about is, is kind of hip hop culture, black culture, being nerds and uh, just kind of, you know, living, living life and going through this journey and just kind of having conversations about it every uh, for an hour every week. Um, great. I have to have a listen, my friend. <laughs> um, tell me about, I guess, um, what you're working on now and what's the future look like? Yeah, so I continue to make uh, music advice videos every single week on my YouTube channel. It's uh, youtube.com uh, forward slash wordplay TJ, wordplay T-J-A-Y. And um, on top of that, right, the No Rhyme or Reason podcast comes out every week. And uh, my last album was called Overtime. It was my eighth album, and it was the the culmination of a series. I started off with uh, an album called Job Application, where I talked about, you know, kind of getting into the workforce and like uh, obtaining your dreams or not being able to obtain your dreams because you go into the workforce. And then there was Orientation Day, right? It's just like I feel seated in my career now. 
And where do I go from here? This is my orientation to the world, so to speak. What are your, so over t- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, over time, you know, kind of finishes that off and it, and it talks about how I've, um, now that I'm seated in the workplace, what am I doing extra in order to get where I want to go? And uh, my, I'm working on my next album called Terry for awesome. next year. That's awesome. Um, what, are, what are your best experiences, just going back to what you were just saying then, yeah, what are some of your best experiences you, like that you can recall, the stories that you can share? Um, so I, I think one of my most um, memorable experiences uh, was meeting Russell Simmons. Um, that was a, a, a super crazy, crazy story. So I'll, I'll go into that now. Like I was 16, 17 years old and in, in, in the middle of Little Rock and I was doing my independent thing. I was performing shows every week and um, spending a lot of time out and about. And then I learned that Russell Simmons was coming to Little Rock. And, you know, I've, over my, my career, I've had choice encounters with um, really popular people that, were inter- that are integral to uh, hip hop history. And this was one of them. So Russell was coming, coming to town and he was coming to collect demos from people in Arkansas in order to shop them to Def Jam Universal Records. And I was like, great, this is my chance. How, how do I get this? How do I make this happen? And so turns out <laughs> I didn't have a ride. I didn't have any money because, you know, I was I was not working at the time. Well, I was, I was working, but I just didn't have any money. And um, so that night I was just like, man, what am I going to do? I'm like pacing in my room. Uh, I don't understand what what what's what's going to happen. I get on the phone and I call a guy from work and, you know, mind you, like he's one of the local drug dealers. Right. So like <laughs> he's going to like I'm asking him for a ride to a place where I don't even have any have any money. But this is kind of how tight knit our co- community is. So I call him up. He's like, yeah, man, I'll give you a ride, you know, if you got a few bucks for gas. And I was just like, well, maybe I can, you know, go into my piggy jar and (laughs) give him some gas to go downtown. Um, We go down there. um, I get up to the door and I didn't know there was an admission charge. So next thing I know, the the guy that's working the door is like twenty dollars to get in if you want to give you a demo. And I was like, man, this is terrible. I turn around, I start walking around the block a little bit and run into another drug dealer he was like yeah you trying to get in there he's like here you go he he just hands me the admission i was like what is going on today wow <laughs> so i i go in i stand there all night um this is about like five or six hours i have my demo in the hand the whole time i get up to russell I have my demo ready to hand him. And he's like, do you have a copyright? And my first instinct was to, to lie. But I like, that's not my, that's really not my nature. And so I tell him the truth. I say, no, I don't have a copyright. And he's like, I can't take it. See you later. Good luck. I, I, I know you're going to make it. And so I leave there without giving him my demo but it, it it's it's serendipity that like later on I run into like the A and R from from Atlantic Records or run into Big Boy and all these other people and my career is like totally churning and this is way before the the MTV thing so like it his words resonated that day right even though I didn't have it ready I still got a lesson out of that which was be ready to have your business ready. So be ready to be ready. So maybe that's one of the lessons that I learned uh, early on to answer your earlier question. So um, yeah, that was me meeting Russell Simmons and not getting a chance to hand him my demo. <laughs> that's one hell of a story, man. Um, what do you like to do outside of obviously everything you do? Like what are, what are your other hobbies and passions? Yeah, so I, I still make a lot of art. Um, so I draw and paint 
and, and those types of things. Um, I also teach school here in uh, Washington State. Um, I teach computer science to sixth, seventh, and eighth graders when I'm not making music and touring and 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 uh, working on a, a new album. And I I really enjoy that. Right, I I enjoy interacting with the kids, teaching them something new, and showing them how to kind of break through with their their messages online. Awesome. If you were eighteen again and you could change anything in your life, what would you change? Um. I would have been better prepared to be on that interview with uh, Sway and Ja Rule. I didn't get a chance to actually be on that interview because the night before I went to the emergency room and I was really, really sick. And so I overslept. And that interview came out of the blue, by the way. Like it was just an email that was there in the next day. But I slept like an hour before the interview even started. And so if I were to change anything, I would just go back in time and make sure that I took better care of myself. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and I guess it, with what's happening in the world, the United States, where do you see the USA progressing? Where do you see it going in the future? Um, that's hard to say. Uh, I, I believe that there was a major awakening with um, the events last year where George Floyd was was killed. Um, and after that moment, I feel like there was there was a paradigm shift. And we've been waiting on that moment for a long time, not his not his death, so to speak, but we've been waiting on that 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 shift to start. And there's a lot of pushback for it, but I don't believe that people aren't ready for it overall. And so um, what I see is that this pandemic, that shift and all these other things are just integral moments for change. And we're going to continue to get evidence of the need to change until we actually do here in the States. Yeah, great insights. Thanks for sharing um, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, I do appreciate it. You, you've done amazing and your trajectory in life and everything you're doing is amazing and it's incredible. And yeah, I just wish you nothing but the best. Yeah, thank you so very much for having me. And uh, I, I really appreciate this time being here. Yeah, for sure. We'll keep in touch. Thank you.